record on my side too here. Okay, so everything's recording now. Um, and it'll be available on my YouTube. So it says on the bottom, it says recording, dot, dot, dot. YouTube, Adam Sadler. Um, so you can take a look there to find the recording after and the PDF for the, for the file, uh, for the what we have written here. And yeah, so as usual, I have notes for this course. They're available on my website, which is www.tutor.ca slash notes. Let me make that way bigger. There's the, there's the button to make it bigger. There you go. So um, my notes are available there for this course. They're complete. They have everything from, for this course. Uh, my professor was a little bit different. We didn't do exactly the same stuff, but we do have a, like, obviously a lot of overlap. We did no proofs, basically. We had no proofs when I took it. So it, that is a major difference, but the second half of the course is not super proof heavy. So for a second, like last third of the course is not super proof heavy. Um, but yeah, okay. So that's that. Now I have, this is what I have. I mean, I have the, I have the 2018 2018 final. I have the 2014 final. And I have a couple of assignments that you guys sent. Uh, I got one email. Um, someone uh, requested some questions, so we can do a couple from there. Um, and um, yeah, but let's hear, I guess let's hear it from the chat as well. Like, what, what do you want me to focus on? Like, I, I know... I think the professor already did this final. I know you have solutions for both, but I think the professor already just like did this in the lecture. Maybe I might be wrong about that. I don't know. Um, this one, maybe he didn't. And then these are just like assignment questions. So like, what do you want me to focus on? He did. Okay. So yeah, out of these, so out of these ones, like which one do you want me to focus on? I can make a poll. Is there a poll? Can I, if it's only if it's a few buttons away, let's see. Probably is a few buttons away, but I don't see the button to do it. So, no pull. Format. Uh, yeah. And assignment 12. Yeah. Makes sense to do the final that he did not cover. I agree with that. So, someone requested some questions from assignment 12. So let's start with the, let's start with that, and then we can go on to the twenty fourteen file. Um, so it was question three and question four. Question three and question four from assignment twelve. So let's start with that. Um, they're they're good questions. I like them. So uh, we can try that, and then uh, from there we'll move on again. Like I said, to the twenty fourteen file. Okay. So um, this is from assignment twelve. Assignment 12. It says, oh, we're talking about relations here, basically, so we have some sort of relation. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, H is this relation or this function that uh, maps from R cross R to R cross R, right? This is like the XY plane to the XY plane. So it's some kind of 2D to 2D transformation or a function that we have. Um, that maps like this. And the way it works is that X replaces replaced with X plus one and Y is replaced with two minus Y. Um, so I just basic example, H of zero one is zero plus one, one uh, two minus one. So it's one, one. So the point zero one maps to one, one. So it's a function maps from one set to another set. Okay. So we want to determine if it's one to one and if it's onto. So I think I, I you know it's good to just uh, describe quickly what is one to one and onto, right? So a function uh, can be described as one to one. The, the, I, I'll show the formal definition after, but um, basically, like uh, if so, one to one is basically like invertible. So that means that if you have some sort of function, you're mapping from your domain to your codomain. Right. And that's what a function is, right? Mapping from domain to codomain. So in this case, this is our domain and this is our codomain. And so, for example, it takes the point like zero, one, like we just saw up there, and it maps it to the point one, one. Right? And that's what our function's doing. I guess our function's h instead of x. That's our function. Um, and basically, we just have to make sure it's one to one, which means that uh, a single element of the domain maps to a single unique element of the codomain, and they are uh, 
there's no overlap. So basically, I'm saying like there can't be another point like five two or something like that that also maps to one one. Basically, yeah, that that's that's it. And and I think a, a nice way to think about that is it has to be invertible. That's that's so that's the requirement. You can't like if this is true, like this is not true by the way. Like five two does not map to one one. But I'm saying hypothetically, if it did, this would not be invertible because if you try to invert, like you know, you have this element of the codomain, you're trying to go back to the domain here. Um, you don't know if it's this one or this one. So it's not invertible because it's not one-to-one. -one. Okay, but I, I don't know, like I'm not making any claims for H yet. I'm just saying what, what it means to be one-to-one. -one. So, so for example, five, two does not map to one, one. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that maps to one, one. So, so the way we do this is we basically test for invertibility. That's how you check for one-to-one, -one, one to one is, is you test for invertibility for invertibility. lot of eyes and invertibility um and so the way you do this is you say okay let's just take an arbitrary element of the codomain let's call it a b right let's call it a b and i want to figure out what is the corresponding x y that maps to that a b right what's the x y that maps that a b and it should be some sort of function of a b um so if I can do that, if I can make like a formula, a for, like, like an algorithm for myself that turns uh, this output into this input, then it is invertible. Um, and, it, and so it is one to one. So that's what we're going to do. We're basically going to test for invertibility. So if I'm saying that x, y maps to this, that would mean that a equals x plus one um, and y equals two minus y. Uh, b equals 2 minus y right because that's that's the formula here right that x turns into this so that would be our a and that would be our b and basically i want to try to undo this to get some kind of formula here like this um and so i am able to do that because i can say a minus 1 equals x and i can say move that over y equals 2 minus b and so what that means is now for any given um, a b value, so let's for, let's say for example I I have the point two five in my codomain in my output. I want to figure out which point mapped to it from the domain. Invert, I'm basically inverting it. Um, I, I can just plug that into here, right? I can just plug this is two and this is uh, five for the example. Let me just be clear. Like this is the this is the example. I'm just gonna do that. This is the example that I'm just doing here. So this is the point two five example example and so yeah basically uh, uh this this does that this uh this proves it is there anything else in the solution here let me just make sure to see if there's anything else in the what they say in the solution is there anything else to say um dun, dun, dun. This one. Da, da, da. Yeah. So yeah, they have a couple more words in there. They have a couple more words there. So I'll add the I'll add the extra words. But yeah, it's basically uh, basically that. So uh, or did I? Oh, I guess I was, I guess I was also half describing for onto. So this is also for onto. So if I choose that, x, y equals a, b. Yeah. Okay. So I was also kind of describing at the same time how to do it for onto. Um, they're very similar kind of ideas here. So I guess for onto, this is more of the description like this. So let me go through what the solution is for one to one as well. And then there's, there's a, there's, this will be a little bit better for onto, but they're very similar kind of ideas. Um, so the solution for one-to-one, -one, um, let's, let's look at the formal definition. Let's go to my notes here. Let's look at the formal definition. So here's from my, from my notes, uh, graphs of relations and functions. And then we have, um, our functions, I guess I got to go to functions. So one-to-one -one is this whole thing. So a function is one-to-one -one if 
basically this is probably the best way to do it or you, you can i mean you can go like this too right is the only way that's possible is if the the um like the only way that the two the function maps to um the same thing is if the input is the same right so it, the only way that f of a equals f of b is if a equals b right that that's the only way that happens which is what i was describing here with this diagram like that right so we're going to use kind of this as our definition to show that uh, uh, it is one to one. If there's any questions, feel free to stop me or type a message in the chat as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's 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 just do it. So uh, we need to show that this is true, basically. And so we do that by saying, okay, well, assume that h of x one y one is equal to H, h of x2 y2 well we need to show that this implies that x1 equals uh, x2 and y1 equals y2 right that the, the points are the same basically that the two points are identical so the way we'll do that um is we'll put this down a little bit more uh we'll just look at this so what does this what does this tell us this tells us here that uh um uh, that the, by definition of the function itself, x1 plus 1, and so x1 plus 1, 2 minus y1 equals, um, and then here we have x2 plus 1, 2 minus y2, they must be equal. So we're saying, you know, assuming this, show that it, it gets this, so we're gonna, we have to use that assumption. And so now, over here and if these points are same their components must be the same and in the same order that's the definition of an ordered pair so this must be true and additionally this must be true and then sorry this is equal and just basic algebra at this point these these are the same so we've proven oh sorry this goes over this um what am i canceling that this one so we've proven that x1 equals x2 and y1 equals y2. So that's it. That's probably the more, that's like, yeah, that's more of a way to do it. I guess this works more for onto, but yeah. So for one to one, you need to show what I was showing in this diagram here, which is that if they map to the same value, if you have two different inputs, well, yeah, if you have two, if you have two different inputs into the function and they map to the same value, um, those two inputs must have actually been the same thing. And so that's what we that's what we show here, right? Is that uh, if I have two different inputs, x1, y1, x2, y2, and they map to the same value, that's what h of it is, right? Then it must really be that they are the same value. And that, I mean, that doesn't always happen. That only happens for on two functions. And so this is kind of the thing here. We've proven, we've proven the statement. Right? So for one to one. So that's for one to one. And now for onto, basically we need to map, we need to show that uh, everything in the codomain gets mapped onto. So that's kind of how I think about it, right? So for example, like the function, the function y equals x squared is not onto. Just as an example here, to give you an idea of what onto means, right? Y equals x squared is a function which maps from r to r. I should do this kind of r r to r right because it maps for you you put in a number and you get out a number um the that's the codomain right that's the codomain and if it was on to that would mean that every single real number um, in this codomain which is every single real number gets mapped onto by the function that's why it's called onto. but that's not true uh, this function only maps onto the positive real numbers and zero. So it's not onto. Whereas if you had a function that was like uh, y equals x, this is onto. Or whatever, 3x, just, this x just has the x. This is onto because every y value gets mapped onto. Right? Um, for the entire output space. So the output space is the codomain, which is in this case R, it's the same 
the same um, R to R for this function down here too. And all of the codomain gets mapped onto, whereas here, not all of it does. This whole section doesn't get mapped onto. So this is not onto, whereas this is onto. And so very similar to one-to-one, -to -one, we just need to show that if I take any arbitrary point in the codomain, in the output, that I can invert it back to the, um, that I can invert it back to whatever was the input, like this. Uh, and, I, and that that has to work if for regardless of what output I choose. Um, so that's kind of more. I'll, I'll rewrite this. It's I mean it's the same it's the same idea as before, but I'll just I'll just rewrite it. So I'll just explain it over again. So for our particular function, which we know is h of x y equals x plus one two minus y, we know that. Uh, it's outputting into R squared, right? This is uh, this is R squared to R squared, right? That's the, or whatever, R cross R to R cross R, which is the same thing as R squared to R squared. So the output is gonna be something in the form A, B. And we just wanna see if we can invert that. If we can always invert that. Because if it, so if it's onto, then we can always invert that. If it's not onto, for example, here, we can't always invert it. For example, if I try, you know, uh, negative two here, like a y value of negative two, I can't invert that, right? Because there is no input value that gets me that output. Um, so that's why this is not onto. But if I did the same thing for any y value here, I could invert it. So that's basically what we do. So we choose a, like we, yeah, we take any arbitrary a, b, um, and we know that's gonna be equal to the output, which is x plus one, two minus y. Um, and then make sure everything the right thing. Yeah, and so we know that a must be in the form x plus one, and b must be in the form two minus y. And you can see like the entire rearrangement happens right here. As long as you can rearrange these equations for their individual you know, parameters, so like here would be x is a minus one, and here it would be y is uh, two minus b. We have successfully inverted it, and so we can. Uh, it is onto basically. And so we just want to verify that if I do this, if I plug, right, if I take h of a minus 1, 2 minus b, then I better get a b out of this, right? I better get a b, because that's the whole point. These are, I'm, what I'm saying is that these are, this is the selection for, for x and y that will get me a and b. And, and of course, I will get that, right? Because this is a minus 1 plus 1, and this is 2 minus b or it's sorry, it's two minus y, so it's two minus two minus b, which is a two minus two is zero minus minus b is b, so a b. Clearly, I get that. So the answer is yes onto, and yes one to one. This is kind of the onto. This is part b. This is on two seconds. I did a little explanation first before I did that. So, unless there's any questions, I'll keep going, but hopefully that made sense. Okay, we have our check for one to oneness. We have our check for on two ness. Oh, I got a message in the chat. Recording will be available as soon as it's done. I'll, I'll post it. I don't know. It might, it might take, uh, I guess it might take an hour or two for to upload. Sometimes it takes a while, but, but, uh, uh, so YouTube can do it. I will upload it right after we're done. Okay, so that's that question. That's this question three from Simon 12. Person also requested question four, so we'll just do question four and then we'll move on to the 2014 part. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. If there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Um, so question four, it says, if, f is a real valued function right so real real value just means that it goes from r to r it's a function from r to r so it takes in a real number outputs a real number so and g is also a real valued function then is the sum oh sorry and they're both onto they're both onto um or is the sum onto so when you're answering a question like this you want to just kind of like try things out 
right? So like, just like test it out a little bit. It's probably the best way to do it. So like, I'll just say test one. Um, if I choose an onto function, so let's say I'm choosing x squared, and I choose another onto function, say this minus minus x. I don't know. Just choosing different onto functions, right? These are both. Oh, sorry, that's not. That is not onto. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I can't choose that. Three uh, x and minus x. Let's do a different onto function. Three right? x cubed. Let's do x cubed. So x cubed is an onto function. Uh, because and just the way I know that is just imagine the graph of it, right? Every y value of the whole y axis gets mapped onto, right? There is you can invert, you can invert all of it. Um, so so yeah, so that's that's the idea here for, um, for that. And then this oh, same same thing here, right? Every y value gets mapped onto for both. So let me just do this one there. Yeah, someone asked something about the first question. Yeah, do you want to you want to? Like you want to see something or just ask a question? The last part? Yeah, it's the last part. Okay, sounds good. So, um, uh, uh, we want to justify our answer here for this. I'm just going to do a test just to see what happens, right? So, if we add these together, this is x cubed minus x. This is still an onto function, right? Because it's it's a cubic, right? It's a cubic. I mean, it's going to be kind of vaguely different than this, but a cubic is always onto. Yeah, so basically onto is saying the codomain is one to one with the domain. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, basically the 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 idea uh, like if it's if it's onto. This implies that the range, the, yeah, the codomain equals the range. That's, that's what it, that's what it means to be onto, is that your codomain is the range, or the range is the codomain, whatever. These are the same set. Um, as in, the, the, the range is the actual values that the function maps onto. So for x squared, it's the, like, positive y values. Um, the codomain is just the type of output real numbers so a set of real numbers here right so if those are the same then then it's on so i guess it's more of an equivalence between codomain and range okay so we did our first test here two on two functions and the result was on two great interesting yeah, that's fine but obviously obviously test it out more right so um do at least another one. So think of ways that you could get functions that are not onto. What are not onto functions? Well, you could get x squared, um, but I couldn't add, I couldn't like add x squared with something else uh, to see if that's onto because x squared is already itself not onto. I could try, I have to somehow combine onto functions to get a function that's not onto. So I, there's no way I can combine again, like x, uh, x and x cubed or something like that, x and x cubed. Uh, well, I did up there to get an x squared. There's no using just addition. We're just adding the functions together, right? Um, so I need to somehow take two onto functions and get a get a non onto function. What are other non onto functions? Well, constant functions are not onto, right? So I, I'm getting some message in the chat. These are two people who messaged me both correct things to do. So constant functions are not onto, um, because if you think of a constant function, right, the output. Like let's say this is like this is a constant uh this is a constant like whatever five here um the output the codomain is all real numbers and the actual range is just five so they are not equal so that means it's not onto so constant functions are not onto um even simpler like just y equals zero is not an onto function so if there's some way that i can combine functions onto functions to get zero um, then that would show that that this is not always true and that is of course possible if i choose uh the first function f of x to be um x and the other function v of x to be negative x these are both on two but when i add them right which is which is what f plus g is of x um this is zero x plus negative x is zero 
that is not on two yeah it certainly it would work with x and, uh well not x and x plus one but x so so it's, yeah so uh, someone gave me a question I, i'll i'll respond to that one second so just want to just want to show here right that that is not on two not on two these are both on two and so since we've found an example we found a counter example so this is not always true but yeah for sure you could always you could do lots of other examples here so this is just like one example or dot 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 you could also do someone suggested in the chat here we do x and x plus one almost would work but if you add these together you're gonna get two x plus one which is onto but if you did negative x here if you did x and negative x plus one then yeah these would cancel right and then you just get constant one and that's also not on two so you could also do that totally g of x but the point is that you have to get a constant function so place that the case so on to i'll just say or you could also do this you could also do this okay so that's it for that question i'll move on to the 2014 final but if anybody has questions feel free to stop me you can of course also unmute if you'd like to um Right. Let's find that final. Put it here. Okay. So I don't know. What do you guys want to see? I mean, have I? I think probably somewhere that's good for us to do is to start with uh with question six because it's a relation like we haven't really talked about it yet like we have yeah we haven't really talked about um passive diagrams so um and maximal and minimal elements and total orders and stuff like this so i, I think we should do this and then maybe even question seven i think you guys didn't do any graph theory stuff right is that correct you didn't do any graph theory stuff or did you do some graph theory stuff Like, did you do the first uh, graph theory, first theorem, like edges and graph theory was skipped. Okay. So I think, uh, yeah, let's start. Let's start. So, so I won't do that part of the test. Um, so this is the winter or whatever, the 2014 final. So I think we're going to start with question six, question seven. And then from there, we'll move on to uh, doing earlier questions or whatever people want to see. And um. Okay, so let R be the divides relation on the following set. So we have this set like this, and we're doing the divides relation, right? So, um, uh, you know, X, R, Y implies X divides Y, right? Like that's the definition of it. Like this is the, this is the uh, definition of what we're saying R is, the relation R. So the divides relation uh, only on this set, and we want to make what's called the Hasse diagram. So the Hasse diagram is only um, uh, is a diagram we make for a spe specific kind of relation called a partial order. Partial order. Partial orders have to be have whatever these these qualities. But we're saying here that it is already a partial order. And I, I'll explain maybe in question seven how to how to verify that. We could we could do that actually. Yeah, we could verify that it's a partial order. But anyways. Um, let's say it is a partial order which, which it is uh, we make a hasse diagram so partial orders have a bunch of things a bunch of properties to them the, the really the important one is uh transitivity right so that it's, it's transitive so um the device relation is transitive and um uh we also have uh what's the other important one this i don't i just want to i don't just want to list them i i, I just i want to just remind myself what the important one is um a reflexive anti-symmetric and transitive and reflexive yeah we'll just check reflexive okay um so re reflex it has to be reflexive yeah so uh the has a diagram let's check here basically if it's transitive reflexive and it's another thing called anti-symmetric which we will check after it's kind of like you're putting things in order that's the idea is that it's actually kind of a way that we already think about ordering elements is that some of them are bigger than others like they're further up the transitive line kind of 
Um, and so because of this already kind of like, it has this kind of quality of an order, we call them partial orders. And so the Hasse diagram is a way to, to show that. So basically like, let's just think of all the, I mean, you can, you, it's kind of just possible to just brute force these kinds of things. So um, like, let's just start with uh, one divides two, right? That's true, one divides two. Um, and one divides three and one divides six and one divides uh, four, whatever, I'm skipping some, but anyways, it divides everything. One divides everything. Everything. Okay. Um, but that's not necessarily true for, for two, right? So two divides six, two divides 12, two divides eight, two divides four, and of course, uh, two divides two. I should mention that. And one divides one. I mean, that that's, that's the reflexivity, so it's definitely reflexive, right? Um, so, I'm just kind of going through it like this. So you want to think of it like, uh, because of transitivity, if one divides two and two divides four, then one also divides four. This fact is already given to us by the fact that we have these two relationships. So um, uh, it's kind of like, all we need to know is these two things because we already know it's transitive, right? We know one divides four. So the Hasse diagram starts with the, uh, the kind of like, most basic element of the set, you kind of draw that on the bottom, and we kind of just draw these arrows up. It's a graph, so we draw it, we draw arrows, uh, but the, we draw edges, and uh, based on what it divides. So here, you know, one divides two. Let's just I'll just list everything. So one divides one, but we don't we don't draw self edges onto on uh, passive diagrams. So one divides two, one divides three, one divides four, one divides five. One divide six, one divide seven. I, I, I'm going to change this after. This isn't the final answer. Nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, oh, no, sorry. There's not a one, two, three, four, no five, no seven. Okay, I missed a couple. Sorry. <laughs> there's no five in there. There's no seven. There's no nine. There's no 10. There's no 11. Okay, that's a little easier to draw. Six, eight, 12. Six, eight, 12. But we're missing out on some things here because, they're, they're, again, we don't need to know that one divides everything. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit, we get more information if we just show, you know, one divides two and then separately two divides four to represent this one divides four. Um, so two divides four, which means I can put a four basically here. And the fact that this chain kind of goes up like that implies the transitivity. This is a Hasse diagram. So since you know it's a Hasse diagram, this this transitivity is implied. We don't have to actually just draw an edge from like this. We it's implied just by the fact that it's connected. And four divides eight as well, right? So that goes like that. And two divides eight, but we don't have to draw that line. It's implied by the connection. Right. Three divides six, so I can put that there. And three divides uh, and six divides twelve. So you see how like I start with having one divides everything. And then I kind of just see how I can break that up into more statements, but it gets a little bit of, of a cleaner picture. And also it kind of tells us more about the relationship between all the numbers. So that should be the answer. I'm going to check that just to make, make sure. Um, is this the, no, that's not the question. Where is the question? Uh, I lost the solution. There's the solution. what the Hasse diagram diagram is that goes through goes through oh yeah there's more there's more edges I forgot there's more edges yes so I mean you just kind of want to see other things here right so two divide six is of course true and I don't have to have an edge from two divides 12 because again it's implied it's implied by the connection um and but four also divides 12 and that's the, that's the Hasse diagram. I just forgot to put those in there so that's the Hasse diagram I kind of did all this, but you don't have to do all this. I was just trying to show you, like, we have a bunch of these facts that we know that are within this set, and we, we know all these division facts, or divides facts, and we can organize them into a picture like this, which is a lot easier to understand. And so you start with kind of that most basic element, and you see, like, we know it divides everything, and then from there, you start kind of just moving things around. And so the, the biggest idea with the Hasse diagram is that you, you don't draw the transitive edges. I'm just going to find my notes on that. I'm saying the right thing. Yeah. So all directed edges point up. 
loops are omitted. So we don't, you know, one does divide one, but we don't say that. Uh, directed edges due to transitivity are, are omitted. So we don't uh, draw an edge like that. And we don't actually, we don't actually draw the arrow head on it. I, you didn't do graph theory, I know, so you don't, don't know this stuff. But I guess in 420, you do, you do do 428 and there's graphs there, so. Okay, so that's it. That's the Hassa diagram for this time. I got some messed up. From two to six, yeah. Uh, so people already, yeah, I fixed it. From two to six, 12 to four, and 12 and four inch. Yeah, there you go. Already fixed. Um, so, yeah, that's the hazard diagram. We'll move on. Let's see what's next. The next thing is answering something about this partial order. So it says, when answering the next four part, write none if no elements have the required property, blah, blah, blah. So basically, we just want to see if we have maximal elements, minimal elements, greatest, a greatest element, or a least element. So basically, the definition here is like uh, a maximal element is like the ones at the top, right? We kind of think of these as like levels, right? So it's like locally, it's kind of like a local max, right? It's like the locally, it's, uh, it's basically it's the highest on the graph. And everything else that's at the same level as it, it's not comparable to, right? It's not comparable to. So we say that these two things are comparable if there's an edge between them, right? There's an edge between them. So it's, this is technically not the highest. They're both this kind of like three levels deep, um, but they, uh, they do, uh, are, they're both locally the highest and they're not comparable to each other. So that's the idea is that they're not comparable to each other, but they're both the same kind of height. So there's two maximal elements. There's eight and 12. Right? Minimal elements are, you know, kind of the lowest, right? And anything else that's as low, uh, it's not comparable to. Well, that's true here uh, for one. Now, greatest element is an element that's at the top. It's comparable to everything and it is bigger than everything. So that's the greatest element. So that would be what that like if, if we had like, um, whatever, what would be a common multiple? 24, if we had 24 up here, that would be our greatest element, right? Because 12 divides 24 and eight divides 24. And that would be our greatest element here. Um, but we don't have 24, but if we did, that would be our greatest element because it is comparable to everything. Comparable just means there's like an edge connected to it. So 24 is comparable to two because 24 is bigger than two in this kind of like hierarchy. We're making a hierarchy with a Hassa diagram. Remember, a, a partial order has like a natural kind of idea of order here. So 24 is kind of like further along in the order, whereas one and two and three are earlier in the order. We don't have 24. So we, we don't have an element that's comparable to everything and is greater than everything. So there just is no greatest element. There is no greatest element. Again, we have no element that is comparable to everything and greater than everything. So that's that and then for the least element we're looking for an element that is comparable to everything and smaller than everything that we have that is one right one is comparable to everything and also less than everything basically everything what if we had 36 on the top um wouldn't quite work because that doesn't connect like that yeah so so yeah if we had 36 on the top yeah so you're, and you're saying on purpose because this wouldn't be connected here so that still wouldn't be a a greatest element because it is not comparable or is there something else going on no th yeah it's not comparable to everything so um it's uh it's not comparable to eight so it's a maximal element but it's not comparable to eight um so it is not the greatest element yeah what do i mean by comparable i i basically just mean like um it's like further up the chain is what i'm saying so like yeah i mean it's on the same chain as um yeah it's on the same chain as actually that that probably is a good way to say it so things that are further up the chain are greater uh, and they are comparable if they're along the same chain. 36 would be, the, would be maximal in this case. That's correct. 36 would be maximal, um, but it would not be the greatest element. Okay, so that's that. One more part of this question, I think would probably be worth it for us to do. Uh, is R a total order? 
So is R a total order relation? Explain why it is a total order relation or give a counter. So basically a total order is one where uh, everything's comparable to each other. I'm just gonna make sure that that's correct. I think that's, I think that's correct. Uh, if every pair of elements, if every pair of elements are comparable, then the partial order is called a total order. Um, so yeah, so like we just have to make sure every pair is comparable. So 12 and six, they're comparable. They're along the same chain, right? Um, Eight, two, and th uh, three and one are comparable, but like two and three are not comparable, right? Two and three are not comparable here. Four and six are not comparable. Eight and 12 are not comparable. So because of these guys, not comparable, not comparable, not comparable, not, not, not comparable. Therefore, not a total order. These are not along the same chain. The point of a total order is that we can definitively say for all the elements of the set that something is bigger than another thing. But two and three are at the same level. One's not bigger than the other. Bigger is kind of like moving up the chain here. Like, so one's not bigger than the other. So it's not a total order, it's a partial order. So yeah, that's that. That is everything. That's, that's, uh, that's that question. There's no questions, I'll just keep going, but feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, let's try question seven. So, oops, wrong one note. Uh, what note do I want this? Okay. Let's try uh, these questions here. I'm doing the 2014 one here. So, this is, we're gonna be checking if a relation is uh, reflexive, and other things. I forget the other things because I don't have the question up right now, but we're going to check all these things to see if it's uh, if it is these things. So these are properties of relations and we check them based off of a just a, a definition. So we're going so our, our relation in this case is defined on R and we want to just see if uh, X minus uh, X minus Y. So like X R Y um, implies. I guess it's a biconditional so like that x minus y is an element of q so the, the difference of these two numbers is rational if that's true then we say that they are related so is it reflexive what that means is that for you know for any a which is an element of r right which is our which is our uh, relation on r so a relation on r is like basically the both both x and y are elements of r Right, both x and y are elements of. Um, so we just take any a in R, and we just have to ask: is is a R a? That's what reflexive means. If 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 this is true, if this is true for any a, that's a real number, is a R a, a related to a. Um, if that's true, then it is reflexive. So a R a is only true if a minus a is an element of the rational numbers. Well, a minus a is zero, and, and zero is an element of the rational numbers. So it is reflexive. That's all for that one. Not that much to say about that one. I'm gonna put the chat up there, that'd be better. Hopefully that made sense. That's our, uh, that's our check for reflexivity. And then we're gonna now check for symmetry. So a symmetric relation is uh, that if, if we have it that X R Y, if that's true, this implies that Y R X. Yeah, the end part here one more time. So I'm just checking A R A, right? I have to verify this fact here. What does A R A mean? Well, X R Y means that X minus Y is a rational number, X minus Y. So A R A would mean that A minus A is a rational number. A minus A is zero. And zero is a rational number, so perfect. Then this is true, because if and only if here, so then this is true. And so, yes, this is reflexive. Nice. Um, so is this relation symmetric? So we just have to prove this implication, basically. So um, if x, r, y, this implies to us that x minus y is an element of the rational numbers. 
Okay, we know this fact is true that x minus y is an element of Asher Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. So then we need to check, we need to ask, is this true? Well, what does that mean? This means that y minus x is an element, this is like, is an element of the rational numbers, right? We have to see if it's true. Well, we know that y minus x is negative x minus y, right? So basically, I, I just want to be clear, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a question mark on top of these, just to say like, we're, we're not, I'm not stating it, I'm, I'm asking, is it true that this is a rational number? Um, and so we know that's a rational number, that is a rational number. And when we know when we take the negative of a rational number, it's still a rational number. Therefore, the entire thing is also a rational number. Therefore, yes, it is true. Right, so, so we know that that is a rational number. And so this is symmetric. It means if X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. We can also just like try it. Like I'll just show you, actually probably good to show you an example here. Like for example, like for this one, like two R two, which tells us that two minus two is an element of the rational numbers. Zero is an element of the rational numbers. That's kind of a trivial thing, but that's true. Just as, as an example, I just wanna show you an example. And here, let's also show an example. Like, so if I have like um, five R three, right? This implies to us that five minus three, which is two is a rational number. And that's obviously true, two is a rational number. And, and so what we're saying, we prove that it's symmetric. That means that three R five is also a rational number. And we can just check this. Three minus five is negative two, which is also a rational number. I'm just showing a use of that in this case. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's that. So that's the, we prove that it's symmetric. And then now we need to just prove that it's transitive. I think that's the end of the question. So transitive. So to check for transitivity, we, we need to show that if, um, if X R Y, uh, and Y R Z, this implies to us that X R Z. That's the definition of transitivity. That's actually the definition of transitivity in, in everything is basically, basically this. Um, so, uh, we'll do this just to see what this tells us, right? This tells us that X minus Y is an element of all real, uh, of the rational numbers. And this tells us that Y minus Z is an element of the rational, not real numbers, rational numbers. And so using this information, we need to ask ourselves, is it true that X minus Z is an element of the rational numbers? Uh, rational numbers? Rational numbers, keep saying. I say, I'm saying rational, so I'm thinking I have to write an R, and so then I say like R for real number is an blah, blah, blah. We have to ask this question. This is a question we're asking. Right? Well, probably a good way to do this is just to say that this is some, this is some A over B, and that this is some C over D. Right. So, uh, what do they do from here? Is X minus Z minus Y? Yeah, there's a there's something that makes more sense here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I forgot to write the, yeah. X minus Y is equal to some A over B and Y minus Z is equal to some C over D. What we can basically do is we can um, uh, solve for Z in this equation. So Z equals Y minus C over D. And we can solve for X in this equation. So X equals A over B uh, plus Y. Yeah. And then plugging that into here, right? Because we know these are equivalent. All of these are equivalent. Like these three facts are the exact same thing. These three facts, like these four facts, to be honest, are the, the exact, they mean the exact same thing. And these four facts all mean the exact same thing. So I can use that. I'm going to put that in here because the implication, you, you use your hypothesis to, to prove this. And so this is going to be A over B plus Y minus, and it's going to be Y minus C over D because X minus Z is equal to this. This is of course A over B plus Y minus Y plus C over D, which cancel. 
And so we have A over B plus C over D. And that is clearly rational. If two rational numbers added together are rational. You can do whatever. You can do that yourself. And so, yeah, the implication is true and therefore is transitive. And that's it. There we go. We showed the implication was true. Slightly different than how they did it in the text there, but basically. Um, so hopefully that makes sense as a proof for transitivity. Maybe let's just quickly show that this, that the divides relation, uh, this might be harder than I, this might be harder than I, than I intended to be, but let, I don't know. Let's, let's just show the divides relation is a partial order, which is basically a similar, very similar set of steps. So a partial order is reflexive. It is, um, a second anti-symmetric and it is transitive okay so someone asked uh why sorry why do you divide again why do i div like why do i have a over b yeah because 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 it's a rational exactly it's rational yeah that's it so the divide relation is a partial order and so we just we're just going to show that here right we have to show these three things that's the definition of partial order you only make Hassa diagrams for partial orders. Um, and so uh, that's, yeah, so we we're gonna show it. So for the reflexive part, that's not what I'm showing. I'm just gonna say show uh, X, R, Y is a partial order. So we need to show that it's reflexive. So basically we need to show that X, R, X for any X, for, I'll say, for all x in uh, R, or actually for well, for all for all x in it can just be that that set there, but I'll just show that it's that it is uh, um, uh, for all not real numbers, but for, I guess for all in integers, right? For all x, okay, it's good to be honest. It's good enough if I just show it for all positive integers, so I, I'll just do that for all positive integers. Um, which is the natural numbers, uh, uh, x, r, x. So x, r, x is only true if x divides x. And uh, what does that mean? Well, that just means that uh, if it divides it, that means that uh, x can be written as n, x. And that's clearly true if n equals 1. Uh, so yes, for all numbers, they divide themselves. Is what I'm, is what we're showing here. We kind of just prove that they divide themselves. If you choose n equals one, because um, any n, right? For any n, any n value, it just means that you can write it like this. Uh, then it is reflexive. So we've proven that it's reflexive. Uh, anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric might be harder. I don't know. Uh, means that if I uh, just find my notes on this, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, what's up here? Oh, way too many tabs already. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Not that one either. That one, right? Yeah. So they are anti-symmetric. So anti-symmetric means that uh, if a, did I say x and y? Oh, I guess that should be, this should be x and y. y and x. A little bit wrong. It's r, I gotta fix that. Um, if x r y and y r x, uh, this implies that x equals one, basically. So that's the idea of anti-symmetric. Symmetric would mean that this implies this, Anti-symmetric is that that only happens if they're equal. So it can happen, but the only time that happens is if they're the same number. So re re reflexivity kind of has to come first here. Um, but yeah. So we can just try that. So if X divides Y and Y divides X, then this would mean that... Um, so I, just, I always forget the order. So it's three divides 12. So this would mean that, and this would mean 12 is 
n. Three n. Three times n. Yeah. So y is n x, and x is n y. Right. Well, I guess you can. Yeah. I mean, we can plug these equations into each other, or we can do something here. But clearly, these only happen if they're the same number. Right. Both of these equations can only be true if x equals y. Uh, if x wasn't equal to y, then you'd have this kind of multiple that's off here. I mean, you can you can sub one into the other. So y is n times n y. So n squared y. So n obviously has to be one or negative one, I guess, right? Um, but either way, uh, either way, uh, x, you know, they're the same number, y equals y. So yeah, so it is, it is anti-symmetric. That's correct. And then finally, the transitive. I think we've shown that divides is transitive before, so I don't know if I want to go through the whole thing. Uh, transitive. But I mean, I, whatever. I'll leave that up to you. You guys show that if x, you know, again, the definition of transitive is uh, here. Right? So I'll, you know, you guys can try that. This this is true for divides. Which so basically, if, if x divides y and y divides z, then x divides z. This is definitely true. So yeah. So there you go. So assuming you can show this, then we can uh, we can believe that this is a partial order. So I just wanted to mention uh, the main thing I wanted to mention here was anti symmetry. So yeah. I'll keep going then on the uh, different uh, uh, questions from the 2014 midterm or final. Let's see here. Is there any specific requests for certain questions from the 2014 final? I lost it. I, I don't know where I put the file. Demo. So we have, I mean, I can just do it from the beginning. I mean, there's this, you know, check if this is equivalence relation or not. I mean, uh, equivalence relation, sorry. If this is a, if this is a, if these, these two logical statements are equivalent or not, I have relations on the mind. We could do something like this. We could do some sort of sets. Um, we could do something like this. Uh, we have some other proofs here. There's some proofs. Induction again. Uh, strong induction. The Hasse diagram, which we did. And then I'm assuming this stuff we don't, yeah, no, this is the last page of the graph stuff. So we, yeah, the last, this is the last question from the final, this, this, wa this adjacency matrix stuff, I, according to the chat, you've skipped, you've skipped matrices. I mean, you've skipped uh, graphs, right? So we don't have to talk about that. Although it's not, it's not wildly hard, but I think it's also, it's just been, didn't cover it. So no need. Um, so yeah, okay. Well, I mean, let's uh, try. I mean, we talked a lot about a lot of induction last time. I mean, basically last time was all induction. So it might be better for us to just do other questions, but I don't really mind doing whatever. Um, let's start with this one, I guess. Let's just go from in order. We can just try this. It's probably been a while since you've done a question like this, so I just want to make sure that you're remembering how to do it. So it says, use the truth table to determine whether the equivalence below is true. Be sure to show how you are determining equivalence or non-equivalence. So if they're equivalent, that means if I set up the truth table for this and I set up the truth table for this, that they have the same truth values. Here's all the possible truth values for a triplet, right? For three, um, um, what's it called? Three variables. So, so yes, I just start building up the, the each equation here, each uh, expression. So I have uh, Q implies R is probably the first thing that I draw. Q implies R, right? Draw line there. And then probably I do P and Q, right? So I kind of just want to work from the inside out for all these expressions. Um, so that's, I have the inside here. And then, yeah, and, and then I basically, I'd, I'd then basically just do the entire left-hand side. So I do P implies Q implies R because I have Q implies R and I have P, so I can, I can make that now. And then I have P and Q um, or is it or? It's or. Yeah, it's or. Um, implies R. And so here's this. Fine. 
And then now we um, fill in all these values. So let's remember how to do this. Let's do the or first. So the or is not that hard, obviously. So this is true. 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 Right. So I'm just I'm just looking at this the first two columns here, see if it's true or not. And then the implication, if the hypothesis is false, the implication defaults to true. And then if the um, uh, imp hypothesis is true and the consequent is false, that's the only time when it's false, basically. So it's like we're looking for a true TF here. So that's a false. TF, TF, that's a false. TF, TF, everything else is true. But you, ju you just want to look for where you see like a true, false, true, false. Those are the places where an implication is false. So same thing that's going to go on here when we fill this in right p implies q implies r so p we're now now we're comparing these two and again i just want to look for a true false so true 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 false so that's false true 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 false that's false and then everything else is true so this is true 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 and then again for the implication we just want to look for a true false so p or q implies r so p there's p or q p or q implies r now the order is flipped so you want to look for a true false, like right? It has to be the the hypothesis is true, but the consequent is false. That's what we're looking for. So that's hypothesis is true, consequent is false. So that's false. Um, true, 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 false. True, 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 false. False, true, false. So this is all. All the rest of it's true. Um, and oh. I think you looked at PQ for the first column. Oh, instead of PR, yeah. Oh, yeah. Looks like I did that by accident. I did do PQ. Oh no, did I do PQ? No, I didn't do PQ. Oh, I did do PQ. Instead of Q. I did P I did PR. Or did I do PR? That looks right. Q QR. Yeah, I was looking at the first two columns. I did definitely I definitely said that. <laughs> So I, I definitely remember saying that. So they're definitely supposed to look at these two columns. True, true is true. True, false is false. False, true is true. False, false is true. Oh yeah, there's a little bit. There's, there's a couple things I gotta change. True, true. True, false, yeah. No, this is false. This is true and this is true. Okay, so then this is fine. So then P implies this. Is gonna, there's gonna be some changes because true, true. True, false is false. True, true. True, true is true. Or no, sorry, true, 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 false is false. True. Everything else is true. Okay. Yeah, is this the right? I'm sorry, I, what's the answer? I can't, am I messing up things? Let's see. I'm gonna scroll through the, through the solution here. Is it equivalence relation? Not equivalent, yeah, not equivalent. So true, false, true, 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 true. True, false, true, false. True, false, true, true. Okay, everything's right now. Everything's correct. Good, yeah. So so basically, like you you just build it up part by part. So that's there, that's uh, there, and then the whole thing is there, and then the whole thing is there. And you just sort of compare it. Just gotta get the order right for the implications. So remember how implications work, right? If if the you know if if you know true implies false is the only case where you get an F, where you get a false. In every other combination, it's um, it's true. The, the the implication is true. So, yeah. So that's basically the idea here is that uh, is we just we just look out for those situations. So anyway, so we we're finished and we see that this is not an equivalent uh, two expressions because the truth tables are not the same. So that's basically. Oh, is there another F that I'm looking for? No. No. That's okay. Solution circle one more answer. I don't know. It doesn't make sense why. Unless that's supposed to be false. Is this supposed to be false here? This is P. This. This. Implies this. No, that's true. Okay. Anyways, regardless. It's not equivalent. So, therefore. Well, therefore it's not equivalent. I will keep going. If anybody wants to stop me, feel free.
So let's see what's going on here. Oops. A bad screenshot. Next, we have some set identities. So we have sets A, B, and C. So we want to just show that these two sets are the same. So I'll do it algebraically first, but probably drawing a picture is also is also nice here just to verify. But yeah, so let's just, let's just do it algebraically to begin with, right? So we have, I'm gonna just follow the solution. So left-hand side is A minus B minus C. So we know, kind of do it in a lot of steps here, but we know the fact that A minus B is equal to A intersect B complement. Right? Yeah, A intersect B complement. Right? This is always true. So if you just want to think about why, right? Think about what A minus B looks like. So it's everything in A, but not in B. Right? Everything in A, but not in B. And so you can also think of that as taking A. This is A. Wait, I'll just try it. That's A. This is B. B. And so a intersect B complement. What's B complement? Ah, I lost my colors. So B complement is doing the other way red. This is B complement outside here. B complement. And so A intersect with B complement is just whatever is in here. Right? Whatever is in that in that section. Of course, we get the same shape. So these are completely the same expressions for the same the same sets. Well, they're different expressions for the same sets. And so we can replace it. So this is going to be A intersect B complement minus C. And then we can just apply that here. Like that's our A, that's our B. So this is going to be A intersect B complement intersect C complement. Technically, there's brackets around this still. So hopefully that makes sense. I just applied the rule twice. And now the, the, uh, the uh, intersect operation is associative, so you, you can you can just drop the brackets and just put them. You can do whatever you want first, basically. Right? And you can just you can just switch that to there if you want to. But I guess I'll just say that. And so yeah, I guess say that. So then A intersect B complement intersect C complement. We can just think of those as a pair. And so now now it's time to think about okay when you're here. I mean. Obviously, you can just follow the solution, but like, oh, if you're coming up with this on your own, you now have to think to yourself, okay, well, how am I gonna, where am I gonna go here, right? Where am I gonna? Go? I'm trying to get this to look like to look like this. That's what I'm trying to do. So, one way, one thing you can see is that we have B complement, and or yeah, and C complement, and here we have B or C. So, you can see that we've done some kind of De Morgan thing going on, right? Because the and has switched to an or and the complements have been inverted sure there you know there should be a complement up here but maybe there's somehow that that figures itself out so if you're thinking about this you know you want to see where you're going look out for some kind of de morgan kind of thing going on so we're going to do de morgan's now which is uh b or c complement and this is the definition of a minus b or c Right, that's the definition based on this definition of of a of difference of the difference of two sets, and that's it. That's the left. That's the right hand side. So that's it for that example. We've proven this set identity. That's not too bad. <coughs> so I'll move on to the power set question. Afterwards, some proofs. So, again, feel free to stop me or unmute if you have any questions or anything like that. Um, so, is the following statement <laughs> sorry, true for all sets A and B? And that's the power set of A union, the power set of B, is a subset of the power set of A union B. So just quickly, let's find the power set of something just to just to get a how do I draw a power set? That's how I draw a power set. Power set of zero, one, two, three. All right, the power set is the set of all subsets. So the so it's basically how many different ways you can pick out um, the different elements from the set here. So you can of course pick out nothing. You could pick out 
any one item. Pick out any one item. I'm just gonna do one, two, zero, one, two. I don't wanna do too many, too much writing. You could pick out any pair. Zero, one, zero, two, uh, or um, uh, one, two, or you could pick out all three. That's it. Obviously my brackets are deteriorating a little bit as we go, but anyways, that, that, that's the idea. So that's our power set of the set one, two, three, just as an example. Again, it's just the, the amount of the different ways you can, not the amount, but it's the, it's a set of all the subsets. You just wanna think about how many different ways can I pick out items? Basically, if you remember from, I don't know if you covered it in this class or if you covered it in grade 12, data management, if you took that, you know, you have the NCR, the choosing, or you, you will cover that in, uh, you will cover that in MTH uh, 514 when you take that next year. So this is just the idea of like, it's just accounting principle. So this is kind of what we're, what we're getting at here. The magnitude of the set. Well, the magnitude of the set is different, but, but th that's the idea is like choosing things. Uh, from this set here. Okay, so anyways, to answer the question, now that we know what a power set is, we're asking if I take the power set of some set, that's a set. The power set of A, this is a set, okay? Uh, union that with the power set of B, any other set, is that a subset of this? So the way we want to just check that, the way you check for subsetness is you check that every element of this set, right? is in this set that's kind of the idea so that's kind of what we're going to do here so we'll just kind of follow the solution that they did and see um yeah so if i take an element of this set right let's let's call that element x so x is an element of the power set of a union the power set of b right Basically, we want to arbitrarily, for any arbitrary x that's in this, uh, we want to show that it is also a, in this set right here. So that means that x is an element of the power set of A, or x is an element of the power set of B. Right? That's, what this, that's what this just implies to us. Okay. And so we can kind of use this to break it up, right? So if this is true, Right, so this is kind of our case one. So if this is true, that X is an element of the power set of A, um, uh, let's say then X, yeah. Uh, then X is a subset. So I guess I shouldn't use a variable because it's a set. Let's see here, it's a set. Just the notation difference there. I just turn it into like a, a, a capital X because it's a set. So that means that X is a subset of A, right? That's what it means. The power set is the set of all subsets. Um, and we know that, uh, um, uh, what is it? Sorry, what are they right here? That X is a subset of A, subset of A union B. And A, is a subset of A union B. That's true. So just think about why that's true for a second, make sure that makes sense to you, right? If we have A and B, A, B, A union B, A union B is this, and A is a subset of A union B. By transitivity, transitivity, that means that X is a subset of A union B, which means that, sorry, capital X, which means that X is an element of the power set of A union B. There, that's case one done. So case one, we're saying that it's this right here. So that means that X is a subset of A. Well, A is a subset of A union B, and so X is a subset of A union B, which means that X is an element of the power set. The power set, there's a lot of words, a lot of the words set over and over again, but the power set is the set of all subsets. So if X is a subset of A union B, by definition, it is an element of the power set. 
and I mean, it's, it's basically the exact same demonstration here for, for, for case two. Case two, uh, X is an element, a subset. You know, X is a subset of uh, B. B is a subset of a union B. So that means that X is a subset of a union B, which means X is an element of the power set of a union B. Uh, and so both of these cases are true. And so we've proven that this is generally true. Right? So hopefully that made sense. Um, we can move on now, I guess. We can see um, question three, which is like a proof question. And then question four is induction. I don't mind doing induction, but we did do a lot of induction last time. Um, so maybe we can, I can do some more questions from the 2018 midterm, because or final, because someone did ask for that. But yeah, there's only one uh, proof question, so let's see. Question three says, prove that for every positive real number, there is always a positive real number that is larger than twice the original number. So for any real number, there is always another positive real number that is larger than twice the original. I mean, that's clearly true if you just think about it for a second, right? So if any number, five. There's a number that's bigger than two times five. Two times five is 10, 11, or 12, or whatever. So it's clearly a true statement, um, just intuitively, but let's prove it. So, um, uh, yeah, we need to show that for all x, element of all real numbers, there exists a y, which is an element of all real, you know, positive numbers. I'll, I'll say all real numbers, but I mean positive numbers, such that y is greater than 2x, right? So, uh, yeah, so here we have, so for all real numbers, x, uh, which is in R plus, um, let me see if I can, We just need to figure out a number that is bigger than twice x. So again, like I did with the five example, like if x is five, then double it is 10, just add one, you get something that's bigger. You can add whatever you want, but you, add, well, you can add whatever positive number you want, um, but you, uh, but, and, and in all those cases, the number is gonna be bigger than double. So I can choose for y, I can say that y is two x, plus whatever, I'll just say one, but you can say whatever positive number you want here and it'll always be bigger. You could say y equals three X, you could do that, right? And three X is definitely bigger than two X. I mean, that's a little bit harder to show, but if I choose that, right? So if I choose y, and to be clear, y is a positive real number because X is a positive real number, doubling that is a positive real number, adding one is a positive real number. So y is a positive real number. So that means for any X you give me, I can find a Y value that's bigger than double it. And I do that by doubling it and adding one. Um, so that would mean that, just to verify this, that would mean that Y is greater than two X implies um, uh, that a two X plus one is greater than two X, which is clearly that one is greater than zero, which is true. And so I guess this is if and only if. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so there we go. So we've just proven that that is, that is true if I make this choice. And uh, let's see, that's the end of the proof. That's the end of the solution that they give. So that's that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that question. I think now let's try to do some either assignment questions or we can go look at the 2018 midterm. Does anybody have any session or do you want to see induction? I'll let the chat decide. So you guys let me know if you want to see induction, some assignment questions, maybe some more kind of relation stuff or function stuff. I really don't mind. I'll look through some assignment questions here. Maybe some of them would be interesting. Videos. Da -da. Look at that. Maybe making that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we could try to use question three here. 
no, no suggestions, so I'll do whatever. So let's try let's try this one. Making a Hassa diagram. So again, it's the divides relation on each of the following sets. Draw the Hassa diagram for each relation. So the, the divides relation is a um, is a uh, uh, partial order, so we can draw a Hassa diagram for it, and so we will do that now. So the way we do that is I'll switch this back to black. Is again we kind of think of like the lowest kind of element, the element that kind of divides everything. I guess yeah, the lowest element is kind of the, yeah, the element that divides the most here. So one divides everything, right? So that's definitely going to be the bottom of our tree here, like this. And so again, I like I like to just kind of start with it like, you know, you don't have to start with like this, but this is how I'm going to kind of explain it. So one, two, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. One, two, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. So we have like one divides everything, but there's more connections here than is than we usually have. Like then then is being shown right now is what I'm trying to say. So for example, uh, ten divides twenty, so that could be together, and uh, 5 divides 10, so that whole chain can kind of just jump up onto there. 5 also divides 15, so that can jump up onto there. Um, and then 2 divides 10, so we don't really jump, but we kind of, you just kind of connect it like that. 2 doesn't divide 5 though, right? So I didn't, didn't do something like that, but I, I can say 2 divides 4, so that can just jump up onto there. So I couldn't just go to remove this pillar here because the two doesn't divide five. So that's kind of an important thing. Two doesn't divide five. Um, one divides one. We don't say because that's not you don't. It's not necessary. You don't put any self loops when you draw a Hasse diagram. And that's it. I think that is that looks right to me. So that's kind of the way I like to do it. Um, it's not necessary that you draw it like that, but you can just draw it. You can just go right for this if you want to. So yeah, what's on the bottom? We have one. 2, 5, 15, 10, 4. Oh, yeah, 4 divides 20. Yeah, there you go. I always forget that. 4 divides 20. So that's kind of cool. But again, like you can't you can't just move this up here. Well, I guess you kind of are. But uh, you can't just think of it like that because uh, 4 doesn't divide 10. So we can't connect those. So uh, we have a maximal element, right? We have a maximal element. Uh, So we have a maximal element, that's our maximal. And we all have another maximal element that's also maximal. So it's like a local max is like what a maximal element. It's a local max. If you want to think about it kind of in calculus terms, right? It's like kind of the highest um, in the local area. Four is not a local max because there is something bigger than it. Th these should be a little bit more vertical. The, the lines should always go up. You can really see what's bigger than another thing, but these are up, but they're just kind of a little to the side. So those are both maximal. And then we have a minimal. That's our minimal. Just be clear, that's the number one there. This is minimal. And this is also the smallest. Or minima. Um, yeah, so we have a minimal element and we also have a minimum element. We don't have any maximum element because we don't have any element that is larger than everything and everything divides it, right? So that would be like a 60, right? If we had a 60 here, that would be our maximum element because 20 divided 60 is 80. So yeah, but anyways, we don't have that. So that's, that's that there. So now, that's everything for part A. And then for part B. So yeah, I'll just say, I'll write it here. No maximal. Or maximum, sorry. Maximum. We have maximal elements. We don't have a maximum element. Hope I'm not saying the wrong thing there, but it, if we didn't have 20, if we didn't have 20, then we would have 4, 10, and 15 would all be maximal. That's correct. Uh, and then for part B here, uh, again, I, I'll just draw it how I like to start drawing it. So so 2 is kind of like the smallest element, right? 2 divides, well, it doesn't divide 3, right? So 2 and 3 are on the same level here. But 
but two divides four, two divides six, two divides eight, two divide does not divide nine, does three divide nine, three divides nine, two divides 12, and two divides 18. I'm a little cramped here, so two divides nine, and two divides 18. I kind of just like to start with one level like this, but then we can start breaking it up more, right? So for example, four divides 12, right? Four also divides eight, so that can move there. Um, six divides 18, so that can move there. Nine divides 18, so that can go like that, right? So I can't kind of, I can't move it. I, I'm kind of moving it. I mean, whatever, they, they connect like that. Three divides six. Uh, six divides 12. So I don't draw a line from three divides 12, right? Because that's implied by the transitivity here, right? We don't, we don't have to draw that. We just want to connect with lower levels like that. That should be it. That should be right. Watch me be wrong, but no, that's right. There you go. 12. That's right. So we have three maximal elements. These are our maximal. We have no maximum. We have no minimum. And we have two minimal elements. We don't have any minimum element because there's no element that's smaller than the rest. And we don't have any maximal because there's no element that's bigger than the rest. We have local maxes and local mins, which is which is how I like what I like to call them maximal and minimal elements. Uh, but we don't have any of these like global maxes or global mins. So that's it. Um, is four also yeah, so someone said is four also maximal. Four is not, I think for, I'm assuming for this one, I've missed that one. Four is not maximal because there is element greater than it. There's something bigger than it. Twenty is bigger than it in this partial order. But twenty has nothing bigger than it, and fifteen has nothing bigger than it. Right, you, you might look at this and say, well, 20 is bigger than 15, but but uh, they're not comparable. Like there's no edge and there's no transitive edge. So you don't go you don't you don't go backwards. Shouldn't have drawn that, but there's no edge like this. Okay. What is the definition of maximum and minimum? So those ones are like that's the global maxes and global mins. So I'll show you the formal definition, but but basically like it's an element. The maximum is an element that's higher up the chain than everything else. And a maximum, a minimum element is something that's at the bottom of the chain for everything. Maximal values is the biggest value and no other value connected to it. Yeah, it's, yeah. That is greater than it. Yes. Yes, that is greater than it. That's correct. With the addition. The formal definition of this stuff, which this is a discrete math course, so I guess I'll show the formal definition, is, um, where is it? Here. It's a little, a little bit technical. But that's basically it. So given a partial order, so this little symbol is used for partial orders. It's just, it's just comparing the two. This is the relation. An element A is maximal if for every other, every, for all the other uh, elements of the set, they that a is bigger than b right higher up the chain that's higher up the chain or they're incomparable so for every other element if you look at 15 for every other element it's either higher up the chain or incomparable so for five it's higher up the chain for one it's higher up the chain for two it's not comparable right there's no there's no they're not on the same chain they're not comparable so they're like this right um and for every for all of this they're also not comparable yeah, greatest and least is, sorry, this minimum is least, maximum is greatest. Greatest. So minimum, greatest element is the maximum, least element is the minimum. I would also prefer to say it like this, but the solutions here say the word maximum and minimum, so I'm just saying those words too. So there's our Casa diagram example. Um, oh, another one, I guess. Let's try 
Yeah, let's try question one from this because I think that might be interesting to do. Quite a bit of writing to it, so let's see. Finish up. So let R be the set of all real numbers and define a relation R on R cross R as follows. So for all A, B, and C, D in R cross R, A, B, so a relation, I just be fair, a relation on something is like a relation from R cross R to R cross R. So for all A, B, and C, D in R cross R, A, B, R, C, D, if and only if, so I'll just write that, A, B, R relate is related to C D if and only if A is less than C uh, if either A is less than C or both okay that's a lot happening A less than C or A equals C and B is less than equal to D kind of a lot going on here so let's try to come up with an example right so R this so um uh, let's say I have two zero. So if a is less than c, so if I had like five three here, this would be true, right? As long as a is that's all that matters is that a is less than c. But let's say a wasn't less than c. Um, let's do another example. Example, example. Let's say this is five and this is a two, then a must be equal to c and b is less than d. So basically, it can never be. A can never be less than C, right? A could be equal to C, but in the case that A is equal to C, then D has to be greater than or equal to B. So six and five here would work. Six and six would also work. Maybe I'll draw that after. Six and five would also work. You know, I, I can kind of imagine how this might come up in some situation. I don't know if you like need to make sure you have more of this resource compared to this one. In the case where that you have the same amount, then you need this kind of buffer to make sure that at least that you have more of this. Um, so I can see how that would be. But uh, anyways, so um, let's try to show basically that this is a partial order relation. So a partial order relation is reflexive. Um, so it's reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. So let's start with reflexive. For it to be reflexive, we need to choose some A, B, and we need to show that A, B related is related to A, B. So this would mean um, that A is less than A, or A equals A, and B is less than equal to B. Well, this is false. This is true and true. True and true is true. False or true is true. So that is true. So proven. That's my little, I don't know, some proof writers write little box and I, I, I like writing little weird little checks. Anyways, so that's our reflexive. And then two is uh, we want to check for anti-symmetry. So anti-symmetry is where um, A, B is related to, sorry, A, A, B is related to C, D, and C, D is related to A, B, if and only if um, A equals B and uh, A equals C and D. Uh, whatever. The points are the same. A, B equals C, D. Which implies A equals C and B equals D. There we go. So we need to show... We need to show this. I guess it's not if and only if. I guess it's just one way. We only need to show the one. So um, we need to now... You know, suppose we have two of these A and B. So we, you know, we have these two points a b and c d so we have these two points like this um uh, we know from this fact right we know from this fact that a is less than c and or or a equals c and b is less than equal to d right that was the definition of r 
a function. From this, gotta get a different color. Let's try this green here. This, is that already the color that was there? Anyways, uh, this is, we know that C is less than A, or, what is it? C equals A, and D is less than or equal to B. We know these, th these things that happen. So if we assume, so then we kind of break it up into two cases. Like if it's this, that's true, or if it's this, that's true. So this is case one, and this is case two. If in case one, if A is less than C, then C cannot be less than A. So then we want to, you know, go back to, we want to go to this, right? So if, if in the case that A, you know, so we assume, assume A less than C is true. Um, if we assume that, I'll rewrite it because I don't want it to be in green. Uh, or actually, this shouldn't be in green. If we assume A is less than C is true, then we look back at this condition, which is our condition for the other one. Um, then this can't be true. This also can't be true. So that means that this whole other thing is false. Right? So, uh, you know, we're assuming this whole thing is true. But if it's the first one that's true, then this one necessarily is false. Right? There's no way. Because, again, okay, so kind of a lot happening. So I'm just going to recap what we're doing. We're trying to show that this implies this. We're looking right now at the first expression, the first expression logical expression that tells us this it's broken up into two cases because it's an or so we have to see now okay well what if it's the first thing that's true because if it's the first thing that's true then the whole thing is true because it's an or statement so if it's the first thing that's true then necessarily this is false necessarily this is false because a is less than c means that c cannot be less than a and c can also not be equal to a so um this is false and this is also false so false or false is false see what the solution says here if a cannot be true and c cannot be true okay so it must be true then it must be true that a equals c so this means must be true so i said case one case two but basically what we just showed is that it can't be case one it has to be case two that a equals c and b is less than equal to d. So now we know this for a fact. Okay. So let's see what I said. Yeah. So we know now that this is certainly true, that a equals c. Remember, that's what we're trying to show. We're trying to show a equals c, right? Um and also that B equals D. So we did the first thing here. We showed for sure that A equals C. And now we need to just sort of show, okay, assuming this, again, this condition breaks up into two cases. This will be certainly false. This will certainly be false, right? So definitely false. I guess let me, let me not write it on top of this because that's gonna be annoying to read after. So now looking back at this condition like this, This will be false because of this. And so we now need to just make sure that this is true, that C equals A and D is less than or equal to B. Well, we know that's true, right? We know that's true. We now just need to make sure that's true as well as this. So we need to know that B is less than D and D is less than B or equal to. And that's only true if b equals d there we go we are done so we have our a equals c and b equals d
So it's kind of a mess, kind of a long one, but I think I th hopefully the drawing makes more sense than just like the text in the in the solution. So we've proven that it's anti-symmetric. Okay, and we have two more minutes left, so let's just do the transitive now. So let's just prove that it's transitive. So transitive, I just write it up here. I for, forget what. Yeah, I copy and pasted it a million times. So there's our transitive. Which is that if x is related to y and y is related to z, but this is not this is this is a b c d um what do they use? E F okay, that makes sense. E F C D E F that A B is related to E F. <coughs> so um here we are. We need to show this is true. So what does this tell us? If this is true, we know this is true, right? That's we know that this side is true here. That's that's the point of the implication. We're assuming that. This means that A is less than C, or A equals C, and B is less than or equal to D. That's the definition. And so, kind of like a big and. Uh, C is less than E or C equals E and uh, E is less than equal to, or D is less than equal to F. There. So we want to use these facts now to prove that this must be true. If this is true, and this must be true. So, uh, yeah, let's see what they do here. So suppose, da da da. Okay, so we break it up into cases again. So this is kind of case one. So let's say so from the first thing that it's the first thing that's true that a is less than c, right? Um, so if a is less than c, then this is certainly false, All right? So how about this? I'll let me just maybe maybe it makes more sense to copy it. I don't know. Let's see how that works. So I'll say case one. Case one, let's say this is true. So this is certainly false. So this whole thing certainly false. Right? Um, so if this is true, that a is less than c, that means that a is less than c, c is less than well, okay, so then we don't know which one's true if it's either this or this. Uh, yeah, okay, so what do, they, what do they do? Let's see. First, suppose a is less than c. Then since, either case. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if this is true, then we have two possibilities relating it to this side, right? Then here, it's either that c is less than e, or, and we're only focusing on c and e for, for the second here, or c equals e. Just, just, just focusing on the c and e stuff for the moment sure also this but since it's an and this must also be true right so it's either this or this and in either case either way either way um uh c or what c is um yeah either way a is less than c therefore a is less than E. A is less than E, sorry. A is less than E. And remember, that's part of what this means. I guess I should write that. So this means A is less than E or A equals E and B is less than equal to F. So uh, assuming this, assuming that this was the correct one, we get it that it's the first thing here, that this is true. So the whole thing is true. Under the assumption that A was less than C. Right? We get that. We get this. And so we've proven the first thing. But now we have to now assume that it's the other thing that's true. So that's kind of like, that's case two. So we've dealt with case one. Case two. 
is assume that this is the true thing, which is that A is equal to C. So that must be false. A is not less than C. A equals C. That's what we're assuming here. And B is less than equal to D. Okay, so uh, over here, we look over here, right? We either have that um, C is less than or equal to E, or this whole thing right here. See so what the solution says? It says okay, an explicit A equals C. Either C is less than or equal to E. Okay, and then we get we break this into two sub cases. There you go. That's interesting. So we break this into two sub cases. Case two point one, assuming this is true, assuming this is the true thing. Let me just let me just do this quickly. We break this into two sub cases, assuming that's the true thing. This is true. Then this is false, and so this whole thing is false. Um, that C is less than E. Uh, oh yeah and so then and then and so that implies to us c is less than e remember that's true so a is less than e and that's uh what we want to show so there we go that that works like that that, that case 2.1 is done and then we want to break this now into case 2.2 which is that this is true again still assuming that that's true that's what the whole case 2 is assuming that that's true um is that c is uh yeah so assuming this is true we know for a fact that a is equal to c c equals e and d is less than or equal to f c is equal to e what were we trying to show well i guess we're trying to show either that a is less than c but that's not possible here or that a equals e and b is less than or equal to f so a equals c is that what we're trying to show yeah a equals e that's not hard a equals e a equals c c equals e so we can combine these two facts here right combine the two orange facts a equals c equals e a equals e there's one part of it right we're trying again we're trying to show this and then the last thing we're trying to show is b is less than or equal to f so b is less than or equal to d is also true and d is less than or equal to f again by transitivity we have that b is less than or equal to f and then then that is true and so all in all, in all cases, this is true. It was kind of a, that was kind of a long one. So I'm going to re recap that really quickly. So transitive, we're trying to show that this implies this. This can be broken up into, you know, all that right there. So that's this whole, that's this whole side is broken up into this. And we now need to break it into basically four cases. Assume the first thing is true here. Assuming that first thing is true, then we can see that we can run to this. And so then that is true a is less than e so that's true okay great we've done dealt with that now what if it's the other thing that's true well if it's the other thing that's true then we need to break that into two cases and in each of those sub cases we need to find something that makes it so that our uh, conclusion is true so in the first sub case we find a is less than e which is great and then in the second sub case we find a is equal to e and b is less than or equal to f that is both true come on one note there you go and then that's true there there we go. Okay. So that's that's the end of that one. That was a long one. That last that last uh, transitive example there. But um There we go. Okay guys, well, it's 807. So that's our time for today. Um If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'll be here for a few more minutes just uploading. But otherwise, I hope this was helpful. Um you can always email me if you have any questions or if you want PDF if I forgot to upload it or something. No problem, guys. Have a good night. Good luck on the exam. Hope it goes well. And I'll talk to you again soon, hopefully next semester, doing some tutorials or whatnot.